Sunday afternoon, and we will get into Luke 17 in just a moment. You know, when we look at sports or uh, warfare or any a number of things, like seeing a magician perform, there's this idea of misdirection. What does that word mean to you guys, misdirection? You focus off of what the main item would be, direct it somewhere else. Yeah, so it might be, watch this, and you don't, <laughs> and don't see what's happening with the other hand. And so in football, we might make everything appear to be a certain type of play, and it turns out to be a different play. Or in war, it might be, we're going to invade over here. That's what it looks like, but it turns out we're actually over here. Now, the Holy Spirit certainly does not do any misdirection with us, but some of us... I know I've been guilty of this, have sort of done misdirection on myself, okay? And this is a chapter that we can do this in, Luke 17. Particularly the ending of this chapter, there's a lot of ways to interpret it, and people feel very strongly about, well, it means this, and somebody else who's just as sincere says, no, it means this. And what can happen is, when we think about Luke 17, we end up, sort of fixating on that part. And we skip over the first parts. And really the first parts, while they appear to be very simple, I think are very profound and from a practical standpoint have tremendous value for us. And we certainly should look at the end of the chapter and do our best to figure that out. But let's not skip over the first part. So here's a question for you. If you can read that, was it inevitable that Jesus would be betrayed? Did that have to happen? Yes. Okay, we've got some yeses. So we know Judas did it, so the fact that it was inevitable, did that excuse the conduct of Judas? No. no. So we know Jesus was going to be betrayed, but that didn't give a get-out-of-jail-free card to Judas. And Jesus had some very strong words for Jesus. So let's look at the first part of 17. These first two verses, we have Jesus saying, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. And then he gives us a very colorful, graphic description of what will happen to those who are the source of that temptation that then causes a Christian to stumble. And so we have this idea of some millstone. What, what's a millstone? Somebody know what a millstone is? It's grinding. Yeah. Yeah, that's not like a little rock we find. <laughs> this is, you know, so he's talking about basically, you know, in our language we might think about, you know, uh, getting some concrete boots or something and being dumped into, you know, the lake outside of Detroit or, you know, uh, New York. 
it, it's the idea you're going to be thrown into this water with this heavy stone. And that's how bad it is. That's how serious Jesus takes the concept of us causing somebody to stumble. Now, it doesn't excuse a person stumbling, but it certainly is a bad position for us to be the ones that are causing the Christian to stumble. Now, he's going to switch on the next verse sort of the perspective. So this is if you're the one causing a Christian to stumble. Now, let's look at if we have somebody who sins against us. So not that I led somebody into sin, but somebody sins against me. And he says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day, turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So, let's see if we can figure this out. So we've got Jonathan Banning here. So we're going to use him as an example, but he won't have to answer anything. So it's, it's sort of a mixed bag, you know. <laughs> so let's say that I sin against Jonathan Banning one time today, and then I go and repent. What must Jonathan Banning do? Forgive you. you. Must forgive him. So how about two times? Same thing. I repent. Same day. Same day. <laughs> you know, Banning's over there like, seriously, twice in the same day? Are, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, but he has to forgive me. How about three, four, five times in the same day. But I go and I repent. What does Jonathan Banning have to do? Stop hanging out with you. <laughs> <laughs> he forgives me, then he stops hanging out. I track him down <laughs> and sin again, but I repent. What does he have to do? Yeah, we're here. All right. And then he like gets on a plane, and he's like, finally. And you know, he falls asleep, and Somebody taps him on the shoulder, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> seven times in the same day, and I repent. What does he have to do? Yeah. Now, here's a question. What about eight times? Forgive. So, we've, we've got to forgive. Okay, that's one answer. So, here's a way to think about it. Is the seven times in a day, is that the minimum you must do? Is that the maximum you're allowed to do? So is that saying that if somebody sins against you eight times, you're not allowed to forgive? Or is seven just setting the floor? What do you think? Seven's a perfect number. Okay. So yeah, it's a perfect number. We have another passage where it would be 70 times 7. I was thankful we weren't doing that because I'd have to draw like a whole bunch of lines and John they would really be like trying to get away from me. So, you know, the, it, I don't think he's saying, well, if it's 8 times, then you're not allowed to forgive. I think if it's 8 times, you're still to forgive. As a brother said, 7 times are perfect. It's, it's this complete number. And it's the idea that this is as many times as it takes. And we talked, I think, in the last class about a story that was told to me as being true from Kentucky. Somebody comes forward during the invitation, and they want prayers of the congregation. The elder goes up, talks to them, prays. And somebody says, can you believe that person's done that five times? And the elder says, what are you talking about? That's the first time. I say, what are you talking about, Elder? You did three of the prayers. He's like, I distinctly remember forgetting those other times. And that's what God does with us. And that's a really impressive thing. Now, for us, how hard would it be if somebody literally sinned against you twice in the same day? And the idea is, at least I take it, it's the same sin. I mean, what would we think if somebody did the same sin against us in the same day, two times, three times, four times? What would we think about that person? It wasn't sincere. 
Yeah, but so you must not be sincere, or you wouldn't keep doing it. Now, do we apply that same standard to us and God? When we sin, the same sin more than once, even in the same day. You know, we tend to not do that. And that's part of that thread that we've been watching through this book, where if I acknowledge Jesus before men, who will Jesus acknowledge me before? Before God, or it's described as the angels, right? Pretty important, because the angels are coming back in flaming fire to take vengeance. So it'd be really nice for them to, <laughs> for Jesus to put in a good word for us. If I judge people with a harsh standard, how does Jesus judge me? Same standard. Same standard. If I refuse to forgive others, what will Jesus say to me? I'm not going to forgive you. You know, and so we see this pattern going through here. So we have to be careful if we say, and it's human nature. I mean, what you said is what all of us feel just like, Except we would expand the time to probably a decade. Like, Don, I mean, I forgave you five years ago for that. Seriously, again? <laughs> you know? But yet, we don't want that same standard with God. We want God to be freely forgiving us. And so he's telling us something here. So, here's the next part of it. What about repentance? Is that a requirement? So again, sort of think, is that... The maximum, the minimum. What do you think about the idea of does the person have to repent in order for us to forgive them? No. Okay, I've got a no. It says as if he repents. Forgive Yeah, and so, and, and look, this class is not, uh, we got a bunch of stuff to cover. It's not a class on forgiveness. I just want us to think about this. Because it, it certainly is very easy to look at this, and if he repents, forgive him, which seems to suggest if he does not repent, don't forgive him. But if we look at this and say, well, is this the floor, or is this the ceiling? And I think we recognize that seven times, that's not saying, well, eight times you don't have to forgive, or eight times you're not allowed to forgive. We always have that ability to forgive. Now, there's a difference between, you know, Arthur and I. Like, I sin against Arthur and he forgives me. That doesn't affect whether God has forgiven me. It just affects between the two of us. Yes, sir. Uh, one example that, that I think is good for us to follow is the example of Christ on the cross. He said, Father, forgive me. Or they know not what they do. They, they had not repented. Yet Jesus said, forgive me. He had forgiven them. Yeah, and, and sometimes we can look at that example of Jesus and say, well, that's Jesus. You know, that's not a man. There, there's no example of a man ever forgiving people who are literally sinning against him while he's saying, forgive them. Stephen. Except that guy. Yeah, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> sort of blows our theory out of the water. Yeah. And so I don't think Stephen sinned by having a forgiving attitude towards these. I mean, they literally were throwing rocks at him, killing him as he's saying these words. So, again, as we think about what do we want from God? Do we want lots of mercy and grace? Or are we saying, no, I don't need that? And we're going to see that in just a moment here. So let's look at verses 5 and 6. To me, these are connected with what he was just saying about if your brother literally sins against you seven times in a day, repents seven times a day, you forgive seven times a day, increase our faith. <laughs> I mean, how can you possibly do this without having tremendous faith? You know, because just our human instinct would be, well, this person's not sincere, they're not really repenting. And so we have to have some faith that, Hey, this is what God wants us to do. We may not fully understand it, but this is what God wants us to do. So I like what they say there. Look at this. This is sort of a, a strange passage in a way, but I think it's, it, it, it's all tied together here. So we have a parable of a servant plowing or keeping sheep, and when he comes in from the field, do you say to that servant, hey, uh, come sit at the table, 
and let me feed you, or do you say, hey, get yourself presentable and you feed me, because you're the servant, I'm the master here. Verse 9, does he thank the servant because the servant did what was commanded? And then Jesus, you know, sometimes he tells us these parables, these stories, and he leaves them. And then we have to sort of draw the application, which is okay. But here he tells us, so you also, when you have done all that you are commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. You know, I was talking to somebody one time about the idea of judgment day and grace and mercy and and um, you know I was being serious when I said it but I said it like you know of course on the day of judgment I want like all the grace and mercy <laughs> that I could possibly receive and I remember this guy looked at me and said why I'm like because I need it he goes well if you'd be like me and just do what's right you don't need any grace or mercy really <laughs> That's a pretty bold statement. You know, what we see here is when we're doing what God wants us to do, we haven't earned anything from God. We don't get any extra credit for that. God says, we've only done what was our duty. We're still unworthy servants. We need grace. We need mercy from God. And I, so I think this does tie in with the idea of this forgiveness, you know, seven times in a day. And, and how we want God to forgive us is related, at least in some part, to how we forgive our brothers and sisters. So, I suspect everybody that drives has had this experience. You're in heavy traffic, and you're in the lane you want to be in. You're in great shape. The guy next to you, he needs over into your lane. So you create a gap, flash your lights, you motion, you you know, go to some effort, and he pulls over in front of you, what do you expect from that guy? Thank you. <laughs> Either y'all are all saying hi to me, or you, <laughs> <laughs> you want a wave, right? An acknowledgement, uh, something for like, hey, you know, I appreciate you helping me out. So here's a question. Does Jesus want the same? when he does nice things for us? Or is this just a human frailty that we have? And I'll, I'll tell you this, if we didn't have the next couple verses, my picture of Jesus would be, well, Jesus, that, that's sort of petty, and he wouldn't sort of keep up with that sort of stuff, kind of like Don was talking about this morning. We'd sort of have a, a picture of Jesus, and we'd pick out what we want. But the scripture is what paints the picture for us. Let's look at this. These are verses 11 through 19. So a, a somewhat familiar setting. We have lepers, and they see Jesus. And so what do they cry out to Jesus for him to do? Mercy. Have mercy. Okay. And so they're asking him for help. And what does Jesus say to them? Yeah, he goes, all right, let me tell you what to do. Go show yourself to the priest. Now, we've seen other examples where it might be a, a blind man says, you know, I don't want to be healed. And Jesus says, well, go wash in this certain pool. Okay. So here he tells them, go show yourself to the priest. We have other examples where he would go up and touch a leper and heal him. But that's not what he did here. Go show yourself to the priest. As they're going to the priest, what happens? Healed. They're healed. Pretty amazing, right? You see Jesus, you cry out to Jesus. He tells you to go do something, which is a little odd, because you're full of leprosy, so you really don't need to be going to the priest. But he tells you to go, and so you go, boom, you're healed. And so this is a, an amazing thing. How many of the ten, it's nice that it's ten because it makes doing percentages really easy. What percentage of the ten do you think appreciated being healed by Jesus? Ten percent. Ten percent. Hundred percent, maybe, right? Ten out of ten, right? We, we know one was is particularly thankful, but I'm just saying, even if they never said anything, don't you suspect all of them? They went from being an outcast to now they're part of society again? 
And so they would all be thankful. They would all truly appreciate what Jesus did. But what percentage go back to Jesus? 10% go back to Jesus. And, and let's look at the verse. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice. So he didn't just say, thank you, God. He, in a very loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet giving Jesus thanks. So he wasn't just in his mind thankful, or he didn't just say, thank you, Jesus. He comes back to Jesus, right? Because he's heading to the temple. He goes back to Jesus, and he falls down at his feet. And he's praising God. He's thanking Jesus. And, and then we're given this little bit of trivia. What's the deal with this guy? Samaritan. Samaritan. Look at verse 17. Jesus is asking a question. I don't know if he's asking to the guy, to the disciples, the apostles, but he asked a question out loud. Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this fine young gentleman, or, or how do you describe him? Except this foreign. What do you think about that? Was that appropriate for Jesus to be keeping track of? Well, you did this great thing for these ten people, and, and only one out of ten came back? Or was that Jesus being a little petty here, or Jesus uh, having too high of a standard? What do you think about that? The lesson for all of us. Yeah, that, that is absolutely the lesson, right? We're to be thankful, grateful. It, it sure seems like, at least in this case, Jesus kept track. Well, no, I, I healed ten. Nine didn't come back. Where are they? And do you sense disappointment in that question? Or do you think he's saying, this, this is fabulous, I, 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 10% came back. Or do you think he's disappointed? He's sad at what's happened. Yeah, it sounds like he's disappointed to me also. And so let's make this very personal, which is what the comment was just a moment ago. Does Jesus do very nice things for us today? We believe in providence. Okay. And, and I'll say this. I don't believe that humans can do miracles. I don't put any limits on God. God can still touch the world. He can touch the world directly. He can touch the world through providence. And so God has done all these blessings for me. And how sad would it be if in heaven Jesus is turning to Michael the archangel, to Gabriel, and saying, you know, didn't I get Arthur back safely on that trip? And didn't I do that? He never said anything. That would be very disappointing. You know, we get annoyed when it's somebody we'll never see again in our entire lives. And we motion them over, which takes like zero effort. And they don't give us the wave. And we're mad for 45 minutes after. These ungrateful people, you know. Whatever kind of car they're driving. Those Toyota people or Honda people or something, you know. <laughs> but God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit... They're doing amazing things for us. And if we choose not to thank them, I suspect this scene is played out in heaven. And if it is, that would be not a good thing for us. You know, we want God to be happy. We want God to be joyful when thinking about us. We like to do nice things for people. And we like to be appreciated for that. And evidently, Jesus felt the same about these. And so it's uh, we should have that attitude of always being thankful. And Don, there might even be a Bible verse somewhere about always giving thanks, and you know, that might be appropriate. Yes, ma'am. What was really sad is that the nine were Jesus' own people. That's right. And, and look, this is, you know, for effect, right? It, it's the Samaritan, like, Really, only this foreigner came back. How about these people that have been my people for, you know, a thousand years? And again, we see the disappointment. 
And, you know, God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. God takes care of people who are not Christians. But how much more when he takes care of us? I suspect all of us, if we've got a certain amount of age on us, we've been in a situation driving where we're like, wow, I mean, that, that had to be God's hand protecting me. I mean, that, that truck was coming. There was no way. It just, I don't know how that happened. And if we don't thank God for that, then we're just like the 90% of his own people not thanking him. So, yes, sir. Well, you have a cleansing here. And it's a death sentence for somebody who has that disease. Just like us, we're sinners. <clears throat> and he cleanses us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, it's so a we great parallel. For, you know, not, not just the minute things in daily lives, but, you know, our sinful nature, our sinful. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. Should we only give thanks to God that he provided for the Bible for us to read? Maybe somebody to lead us into finding the truth and for us to be able to have this path of salvation? Should we only thank God two minutes after we come out of the baptistry? Or is this something for our whole life? We ought to be thankful to God that we're allowed to be a Christian. We're allowed to be his children. We've been adopted by God. Though we're sibling, if you want to think about it that way, with Jesus. We ought to be always thankful for that. That's not something, well, you know, 40 years ago I told God thanks for that. I think that's supposed to be a more constant attitude. Well, let's look at what generally is focused on in this chapter. So it'll help us, I think, in the, the next two sections to know who is asking the question. And that might give us some insight. So here we have the Pharisees, verse 20. They say, when will the kingdom of God come? Now sometimes Jesus would not answer people. You know, they would ask him, we're going to see this in a chapter or two where they ask him a pretty good question. He goes, i tell you what, I'll answer your question if you answer my question. They go, whoa, we're not doing that, okay? But he answers this. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So he's saying this to Pharisees. We may not understand every detail about this, or maybe we do. Let me tell you, I don't, but you guys may understand. What is this talking about, 20 and 21? It's not coming in ways that can be observed. Let's just start there. What, what does he mean by that? There's going to be no trumpets or things coming in a carriage or anything like that. Yeah, this is not the way that you would announce that you're forming a kingdom. You know, you, you would do things in a more impressive way. You wouldn't do the baby in the manger, right? You would, you would do things in a much more visible manner. What about the kingdom of God is in the midst of you? What is that talking about? It's within the heart. It's spiritual, not a, an earthly kingdom. And it's within us, spiritual. The gospel. Love, joy, peace. Yeah, and that is, I, I think, a very reasonable interpretation of that. It's in our heart. There's another view of in your midst. What would that be? So, yeah, I, I'm right here. <laughs> Y'all are asking me this question. Where is the kingdom of God? It, it's right here. I'm standing in front. Of you. That may be the idea. And it could be both. It could be, well, the kingdom is it's in your heart. Also, look, I am you know, deity in the flesh here. And, and I'm talking to you. And so pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't be looking for the trumpets and, and everything else. Any thoughts on that before we move on? Just one quick thought. Uh, not coming in ways that can be observed. Of course, Jesus could be observed. He was there with them and could be observed. So that might not be, I don't know if that's important or not. It may be. And look, this is a, it's funny. I, I usually don't read commentaries. I'll read like very short commentary just for facts. I 
am not real big on, well, here's what somebody says, some theological doctrine. But I thought, well, I'm just going to look at some commentaries on this. And then I narrowed it down to, you know, preachers and elders that I have a lot of respect for. And there's this group over here that are like, clearly, it means X. And if you think it means Y, you're just totally off. Then there's a group of people I respect over here. Clearly, it means Y. If you think it's X, you are just mystified. <laughs> so this is, to me, complicated. And, and, and look, sometimes Jesus talks, and, and there are layers to what he says. Okay, There's sort of the, the obvious, and then there's things beneath the surface. But let's see if we can figure this out a little bit more. So verse 22, hey, remember the Pharisees asked him, but where's his king? Well, you're not going to be able to see it, and it's in your midst. Verse 22, he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you, who's the you? Yeah, the disciples. So, the days are coming when you disciples will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you disciples will not see it. And they, we don't know who the they are, but it's not the disciples. They will say to you, the disciples, look there, or look here. Doesn't that sound slightly familiar with Look, here it is, there. So, he's using the same language. Do not go out or follow them. And then verse 24, For as the lightning flashes, lights up the sky from one side to the other, so the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Maybe we'll do this sort of backwards. Do we understand verse 25? Well, what's he talking about in verse 25? What's that? Yeah, I've got to be arrested, I have to be betrayed, I have to be tortured, crucified, and that has to happen. And then we go back up 22, he, he's saying to these disciples, you'll want to see one of these days. And what's he warning them about in these verses? Yeah, I'm not going to be with you, and you're going to long to you know, to, to maybe have this opportunity or to see something. And as you're looking for me, some other people will start saying what? He's there, he's here, he's... And what does Jesus say we should do to those who are saying, look, it's here, it's there? Just ignore it. And then 24, for as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So let's do this as a team project. I will take the first part. <laughs> <laughs> lightning flashes in a you know, dark you know, night. It, it lights up the sky, sort of all distance that you can see. So I did the hard part. You guys do the easy part. But... The next section. What is that? So will the Son of Man be in his day. What do you think that is? It sounds like the second coming when he appears. Yeah, and that's certainly one way to view this is as we get into some more verses, he's talking about the second coming. Okay. And so, unlike the first coming with baby in the manger, this when Jesus comes a second time, there's no doubt about it. He's the Lord of Lords, as was said this morning. He's the conquering, you know, king. And so that could be it. You know, some people view this as this passage we're looking at is the destruction of Jerusalem. Others look at this whole thing and say, well, this is really talking about the establishment of the church. Right? So let's go on. And maybe we'll learn a little bit more. So just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of Son of Man. And in verse 28, likewise, just as in the days of Lot. So he's saying, there's some things that happened with Noah, some things that happened with Lot, and that's going to be very similar to whenever this day is coming. So what was going on in the time of Noah? Yeah, there's a lot of sin, and he may be talking about that. But if we sort of exclude the sin, just what were they doing? Ignoring. 
Yeah, yeah just, I mean, they're just going about their life, right? You know, you, just like we might say, well, you know, it, it doesn't matter who's in the White House or who wins the Super Bowl or, like, I got to get up Monday morning, I got to work, I got to do this, you know, I've got I got to take the garbage can out to the street, you know, it's like life goes on, even in this pandemic, you know, like, well, life goes on. And same thing with Lot. So if we go back to verse 27, they were eating and drinking and marrying, be given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and then they were all destroyed. And we certainly know they were sinful. Verse 28, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But when Lot goes out, fire comes down, destroys them all. We know those people were sinning too. So that it certainly is accurate to say these people were just consumed with sin. And, and that's sort of the way I take this, but I also see it could be, they're just, Jesus is just saying, look, they're going about their life. You know, they, they don't know anything's about to come. I mean, if they knew in the time of Noah that there was going to be this unprecedented flood and they would all die by drowning, which I understand is not a pleasant way to die. I mean, I guess nobody's ever told us, but, you know, it just seems rather unpleasant. If they knew they were going to die by drowning, what would they have done? They, they would have done just what they did because Noah told them a flood was coming. <laughs> <laughs> it may be they, they didn't believe it. That's the problem. You know? But if they believed in their mind, oh, wow. I, I mean, like, you know, the, the water is one inch, and now it's two inches, and now it's, you know, hey, heard that old story, right, of the, the flood coming and the ladies praying to God and somebody comes by in a pickup truck, you know, I'm afraid to God. And the water rises, somebody comes by in a boat, hey, get in, no, 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 God's going to save me. And then she's on a roof and a helicopter comes by and, you know, we're here to save you. No, God's going to save me. She dies, she goes to heaven, and she's like, God, why didn't you save me? He's like, I sent a truck and a boat and a helicopter. You know, so if, if they were watching the water rise up and they could have gotten in the ark, they, they may have done that. With Lot, if, remember his, who was it that Lot tried to, to explain, we've got to get out of here? Yeah, sons of them. And even the angels are sort of directly intervening in this. And if these people knew they were going to die by fire, again, seems like a rather unpleasant way to die. They would have done something. The point is they didn't know because they didn't believe. And so he's saying, look, they're just going about doing all their stuff. Verse 30, so it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Yeah. You know, just that verse kind of makes me think second coming. You know, all right, he's here like a thief in the night. And now, those who argue this is the destruction of Jerusalem would say, well, you know, they didn't think it would really happen, and all of a sudden it happens. And even the idea that this is really the establishment of the church, it, like, it, it just happened. There was no great announcement, no, hey, in six weeks from now, we're going to have this massive get-together, and we're going to talk about the establishment of the church. It just happened on the day. So, here are the final verses. On that day, whatever day we're talking about, that day, verse 31, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away, and let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Is anybody old enough or had the interesting experience of attending a congregation where the clock in the back had a sign over the clock. <laughs> Does anybody remember that? <laughs> you know, I remember as a kid, turning around, looking at that, going, oh, whoa. <laughs> you know, that, that's a problem, okay? So remember Lot's wife. He says, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, lose his life will keep it. I tell you, that night, verse 34, two in one bed, one will be taken, one left. Verse 35, two men grinding, one taken, the other left, and then they say, where? Now, I don't know what they mean by where. Do they mean where are they taken to? Or where is this happening? But Jesus says, where? The corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So that's the remainder of our passage. So let's see if we can figure this out. 
What's the point of verse 31? And 32 may give us a hint. What's the point of verse 31? Be ready. And when you know you have to do something, don't be looking back. Remember, that was the, it might seem like a strange command to us. But God told Lot and his wife, don't look back. Now, if we think about it, and <laughs> I'll confess this, I would never describe Lot as a righteous man except the Holy Spirit does. And so, I didn't. But she was married to a righteous man. She did a whole bunch of what God said. I mean, she got out of the city and she just did like this one little thing. That was a problem. So here we have, don't look back. When you know what you need to do, do it. And, and do it with full effort. We've seen that. Jesus talked about nobody who's, you know, plowing and turns around, that type of thing. Verse 33 is something... We see this all through Luke, where it will say, like, you want to be first, be last, last will be first. And so we have this sort of ironic statement. What in the world is 34 and 35? Is this the rapture, or what is this? Well, I'll tell you very sheepishly what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe he's talking about the saved the unsaved. I think it's figurative two in one bed that, that one, some will be saved, some will be unsaved. So if this is the second coming, we're told when Jesus comes back, what will the saints do first? Rise in the air to meet him first. Yeah, the dead first, and then the... And so maybe it's talking about that. Maybe if this is the destruction of Jerusalem, the idea that the Romans might come in and say... All right, you stay here, you come with us. I, I don't find that as persuasive. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's the, the, the idea is there will be some, can we say it this way, there'll be some surprises. And there, there will be people that you say, well, I wouldn't have thought that person or this person. But God will make those decisions. What about this, where the corpses, the vultures, your version may say the eagles will gather? What do you think about that? Apparently this was sort of an expression back then. What do you think that means? You know, John, if this, is a, if this passage is a parallel to Matthew 24, in Matthew 24 they come to him and they say, look at these beautiful stones and beautiful buildings and he says, not going to be one stone left on the other. And so they come to him and ask him two questions. When will this happen? This is catastrophic. When will this happen? And then the second question is, what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And if this is the parallel to that, then in verse 30 would be the end of the section about the second coming. And this then would be the business with the destruction of Jerusalem. And in verse 33 then would be you already, I've told you, when you see when you see the armies gathered around Jerusalem, you've got to leave. If you try to preserve your life, you'll lose it. If you're willing to leave behind what you have, you can keep your life. Two will be in one bed, one will decide to get up and go, one will decide to stay. Two women are grinding together, one decides to stay, one decides to go. What is this? Well, it's when, it's when the eagles, when the Roman eagles gather around the holy city. If this is the parallel to Matthew 24, then it could easily be told to about those two scenarios. Yeah, and it's a great point because we get that vultures gather around corpses. We don't normally say, well, bald eagles gather around. <laughs> but the Roman legion was symbolized as the eagle. So maybe that's what he's talking about. And I'll say this, and hopefully if I heard Don, because it was a very good discussion of this, Really, whatever our view is, you can apply it to the other. You know, the idea that if you see the armies gather around Jerusalem, get out now. Don't go back and get your stuff. You know, don't try to preserve your wealth. Just get out. Wasn't that true for us spiritually? 
if we say, wow, I've got sin in my life, and Jesus is saying, you got to get out of that, we don't go, well, but I just want to kind of come back over here. And so it may be that this whole thing is talking about second coming. Maybe the whole thing is talking about destruction of Jerusalem. It may be split. So there is Matthew 24. uses similar imagery. I will say this, just because similar images are used does not always mean in the Bible it's the same thing. But it's surprisingly similar. And, and it may be that it sort of, he weaves in and out of this. Because in a sense, the destruction of Jerusalem of the temple would be so unbelievable and catastrophic. It would be like the end of the world. So I know the bell is wrong. I'll just say this. I think the lesson for us, we should study this. We should do our best. Don't skip the first part. I've made that mistake before. Oh, that's just about forgiveness and lepers and being thankful. There's a whole lot of practical stuff there. But whatever our interpretation of this ending is, it's we've got to get to where Jesus is. And no delays, nothing slowing us down. Hebrews talks about don't be encumbered by sin. You know, you're running this race. Get to Jesus and win. And don't worry about this other stuff. So, I appreciate all of your comments. And uh, next chapter, I think we'll not have such uh, challenging language. If I had timed this better, I would have made Carson teach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs>